Hi everyone, I'm Katie Sakura, the Family Education and Engagement Liaison for the Global Foundation for Paroxysomal Disorders. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Child Life and Supporting Siblings. Today, Lindsay Ramich, Certified Child Life Specialist, has joined us to share more about this specialty, the services they provide, and knowledge about the support for siblings and children with complex health care needs, or of children who will or have experienced the death of their sibling. Some may have had the opportunity to virtually meet Lindsay from a previous GFPD event, but for those of you who may not have, it's my privilege to introduce her. Lindsay is a certified child life specialist who worked for years with pediatric hospice patients and their families. She earned her bachelor's degree in human development and family studies with a concentration in child life from the University of Alabama. She completed her child life internship at TriStar Centennial Women and Children's Hospital in Nashville, Tennessee. In addition to working with pediatric hospice patients, she is also passionate about the work she did with Camp Hands of Hope, a weekend family grief and bereavement camp held three times a year where she created the curriculum for the five to eight year old group sessions. If you attended our webinars, you may know that sometimes they've been a little bit lengthy. Um, this one's going to be a little bit shorter. And so we hope to be able to take some time at the end to really um, dive into having some discussion and answering any questions that you may have about this important topic. So you can go ahead at any time, though, and start asking questions. Uh, there's a box located beneath the webinar player window for questions and answers um, that you can, it says Q&A, you can just submit at any time. There's also the chat box feature, which will allow you to choose if you want to send them privately, if you want to just put them out there for everyone to see. But please go ahead and don't hesitate to start sending the questions in throughout the presentation. Um, and we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for being with us, Lindsay, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. All right, hi everybody. Um, so I am Lindsay Ramage and I'm going to be your presenter today. Um, and we're going to be talking about, um, as Katie said, uh, what a child life specialist is and also how to support um, siblings of a child with complex health care needs or who has a terminal illness. So here's just kind of our roadmap, what we're going to go through. Um, first, I'll introduce myself to you. Um, and then go over what is a child life specialist and how can we help? Um, and then how can I support the siblings of my terminally ill child? So this is me. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lindsay. I know Katie already did um, my great little intro, uh, but I spent four years working in pediatric hospice, um, which was wonderful and I loved every minute of it. Um, and I spent a lot of time, most of my time supporting um, patients and their siblings um, during their admission and during bereavement, so after a child had died. Um, and I, during that time, was able to do a lot of support for parents on how to support um, siblings. So that's a lot of what I'm going to be doing today is just talking to you guys about how to support um, your siblings. And then like she said, I was also able to create some curriculum for a grief camp um, for kids who had lost a loved one. Um, currently, I work for Make-A-Wish South Carolina. I just recently transitioned um, to a non-clinical um, role um, where I'm a wish manager and volunteer coordinator. Um, so even though I'm not currently working um, clinically as a child specialist, I still love being able to do things like this um, and help navigate um, the hardship of a child's illness. So what is a child life specialist? Um, if you've spent some time in a children's hospital, which I imagine um, a good bit of you probably have, you may have um, come across a child life specialist before, but maybe didn't completely know what they were. Um, so most often they do work in a hospital, um, specifically a children's hospital, sometimes other hospitals that have a larger pediatric population. Um, but also in pediatric hospice or palliative care, and then some, um, it's becoming more prevalent, prevalent now, um, even to be an outpatient um, private practice. Um, but most often where you'll find a child specialist would be um, in a children's hospital. Um, so here is just the definition of a child specialist. Um, so we work in healthcare and community settings, helping infants, children, youth, and families cope with stress and uncertainty due to acute and chronic illness, injury, trauma, disability, loss, bereavement. Um, sometimes people use this definition to just say any 
um, difficult circumstance um, revolving around healthcare. Um, and that could be their own um, experience or a family member's. Um, and so as a child specialist, we provide evidence-based developmentally and psychologically appropriate interventions um, that include therapeutic play, preparation for procedures, education, um, that is all to the end to reduce fear, anxiety, and pain. Um, and that comes directly from the Association of Child Life Professionals. Um, so the biggest thing I want you guys to take away from that is that play is the base for all we do. So child specialists have a background in development, child development, human development. As you heard Katie say, my degree is in human development and family studies. Um, and so we learn about how a child's development impacts the way that they may cope with different things. So such as being in the hospital, such as their sibling being sick, um, losing um, a loved one at a certain age or developmental um, stage. Um, and for that, we use, for, to help them cope with that, we use play for, for all that we do. Um, so we believe that play is the language of children. Um, and that play is going to be the way that they communicate their fears and the way that they also are able to um, to um, sorry my train of thought just left but um, the way that they're able to communicate their fears and also um, kind of just play through um, the fears that they have and the anxiety to come on the other side to develop their own coping. Um, so the great question, um, after you know what a child life specialist is, is okay, great. How can they help me? So child life specialists can provide support. Um, like I said, through therapeutic play, um, through art, through reflective listening, um, basically through whatever means, that the child that they're working with is going to most respond. Um, so if you have a very artistic child, um, they may use art for that. If you have a child who's very imaginative and loves dolls and imaginative play, then that's what they're going to use. Um, if you have an older child, maybe, who is more into just talking through things, then that's what they're going to use. Um, to help provide support um, in the ways that they need it. Um, and then on the other side of that support um, is also education um, to siblings in the hospital. Um, I will also say uh, I am focused on this presentation and the ways that they can help siblings. There are also a lot of ways um, that, they, that we um, help patients um, and such as advocating for comfort, positioning, appropriate toys and sensory items, memory making. Um, but since this presentation is primarily focused about siblings, that's just kind of the support that I focused on here. Um, so um, with siblings, they can also provide education. Um, so that can be education about changes and decline that may be coming um, for their sibling. It could help them prepare for new equipment that might be coming home, that you might be coming home with. It could help prepare them for surgeries and procedures um, and also prepare for decline or death. Um, they can also, we as child specialists also help with education and support of parents um, to know how to help siblings who may not be able to be present during child life hours. Um, and I think that this is a very important um, piece to note, especially in this time when you guys may be in the hospital with your kids and siblings aren't able to be there. Um, but they may be struggling at home or they may be struggling with um, the hospitalization or what's going on. And so a child life specialist can come in and just talk to you um, and talk through what, what can we do to help make this easier for your sibling who's at home who can't be here. 
um, or what can what can you do at home? How can we talk through these changes um, that may be happening with their brother or sister? Um, or how can we prepare for um, this next step, this next surgery, anything that may be happening? Um, and even when there's not a pandemic, a lot of times kids are coming after school, they're coming, um, you know, on the weekends, maybe when a child specialist is not present. Um, and so you can still use that resource, even if they're not physically there, maybe to do the one on one therapeutic play or um, have that support directly with a child specialist, you can get that support for them through you. So um, an important thing to know um, is that sometimes, as you all know, um, as parents of children with healthcare needs, sometimes you have to advocate for yourself. Um, so a story, so I always like to tell people um, that a child specialist is often a staff member who's not a volunteer um, that's coming in with a toy. Um, which sometimes people are like, oh my goodness, I do not want a toy, leave me alone. Um, and this is just kind of our way to establish ourselves, non-threatening, we're coming in, we're not going to poke you, we're not going to do something um, scary. And also a lot of times we're not really sure what we're walking into. Um, so there could be siblings there, there could be, you know, we're not always completely sure. And um, so we're just kind of trying to bring something it could be a toy or bubbles or you know something to just kind of say hey I'm not here to do anything scary I'm not here to do anything that's going to hurt I'm just here to um get to know you guys basically um but also in some hospitals um child life services have to be requested by the nurse or the doctor and they may think they may see you there with your notebook of all the stuff that um, you need that um, is needed to know about your child and you have everything together and organized and they don't see any siblings in the room. So they say, oh, you've got everything together. This mom is great. They don't need child life. I'm not going to put in a, con a consult. So now you have this tool, you know, um, that a lot of places this is available. And if you need extra support, ask for a consult, ask if it's available at your hospital. Say, hey, I know that we don't have siblings here in the hospital, but we do at home and they're struggling. Could you put in a consult for a child life specialist to come by and see us? Um, also, uh, just as a side note, and Katie and I have talked about this before, um, how, you know, the first time she met a child life specialist, it was kind of, um, not a great time. They came in with a toy and she was like, I do not need this. You know, she was kind of turned, turned that child life specialist away um, because she didn't understand. And so I always encourage parents. I say, and um, a lot of times the first time they're coming in, like I said, they have a toy, they're coming in just for an introduction and for an evaluation. If it's a bad time, advocate for yourself, say, Hey, it's a bad time. Come back later. And that's fine. Um, but try not to decline altogether. Try to hear them out, see what, see what they're offering, see what they're asking for. Um, because we want to do what you want to do. We want to see how we can help. Um, and like I said, a lot of times we don't get all the information. Um, because what we're getting, the, all the information we're getting is from the nurse or the doctor. And a lot of times they don't know what your situation is at home. They don't know about all the brothers and sisters or um, anything like that. And so um, just let them come in, talk to you. Um, and then if after that, you still are like, you know what, it's not for me, we don't need it this time around, that's fine, decline it. And um, just say, I think we're good this time. Um, and they will respect that. I hope anyway, I can't speak for all child life specialists, but I would respect that. <laughs> um, but I do encourage you just if you have, you know, have had someone come in and it was maybe a bad time, um, just say, hey, look, it's not great. Come back later and um, advocate for yourself there. Um, but try to try to see in what ways that they can help. And um, so that is kind of just my quick rundown of child life. And now we're going to shift gears a little bit into um, 
ways to support siblings um, of a child with a terminal illness or complex health care needs. So first we're going to start off, um, it's really the most common question I get um, when I start working with families um, is what, what behaviors do I need to look out for? Um, because there are a lot of behaviors to be expected. There are a lot of behaviors that are normal and typical um, as these siblings are going through a lot. Um, and so some things that are typical um, to, to be expected, um, as, and especially as things are changing. Um, so for instance, when they're is a hospitalization, when there has been a decline, um, when there has been maybe something new added to the schedule, new therapies, things like that, some kind of change that kind of usually triggers new behaviors. And um, so these are the kind of things that we typically see um, being clingy, needing your attention, um, acting out, small developmental regressions, um, like bedwetting, baby talk, um, usually these kind of come and go. Um, it's not a long-term thing. Um, and I'll kind of go into when you should seek help for that. But um, when it's a small developmental regression that, like I said, kind of comes and goes, um, it's, it's normal. Um, it's also really, really typical. This is, I would say, another really common thing. Um, that I hear is my child talks about dying all the time or they, you know, play with their dolls and the dolls die a lot or they get sick or um, all these things. That is typical. Like I said at the very beginning, play is the way that kids communicate. That is um, how they process their world. Um, just kind of the way that we think through things and verbalize things, kids um, g think through and, and communicate through their play. Um, so if that is kind of maybe what they're thinking about or what they're not sure about. It might not even be um, a fear necessarily, but just something that they're not sure about, or they're not sure how it works, or they're anything like that, um, then that's something they're going to play through. Um, and that is, they communicate um, what they need through their play and through their behavior. Um, so both of these things coupled together, you can usually kind of, a lot of times pick up on, um, what what is going on so if you see these new behaviors kind of coming up you might be able to observe their play a little closer and notice um maybe some of those themes and then ask some um some questions um but when asking your questions they're not always going to be able to um and i'll talk about this a little bit more later but um they're not always going to be able to connect the fact that um their behavior is connected to their feeling. So they might be feeling worried um, because now um, brother can't walk anymore and that is making him sad and that's making him act out. They can't connect all those things together. Um, they're just acting out. Um, and so you have to kind of play through that and kind of dig and just and ask and um, but there if you say like, well, are you worried about brother not being able to walk, they may say no, because they don't realize that that's what they're worried about. And um, so it's just being there as a support being there um, and present with them and allowing them to play through it. I think that's the biggest thing. Um, is kind of allowing them to process it. Um, just like as adults, when we need to process our emotions and we need to talk, talk something out and someone shuts us down, um, that can be really difficult and it can be difficult to then bring it up again to someone else. And it's the same way with children. Um, so if they need to process that, they need to play it out and 
because they do maybe have a fear about their brother dying. So they're playing out these different scenarios where people are dying, but they're continually told, no, you can't play about people dying. Um, then it's going to be hard for them to then do that again when it's really not something negative. Um, it's just something that they're trying to play out and process and figure out for themselves. Um, so now we'll just kind of um, switch over to, like I said, the common question is what, what behaviors are concerning? Um, so some red flag behaviors are withdrawing from activities that they previously enjoyed. Um, and I mean things that they really, really enjoyed, not just typical, you know, outgrowing Legos or something like that. Um, but things that they were very engaged in and all of a sudden now they're not. Um, a steady major decline in school performance, changes in eating or sleeping, um, and I'll add to that that um, like a major developmental regression or a developmental regression that lasts um, a longer amount of time that isn't correcting itself, um, and, or withdrawal from all your support systems, from all support systems. Um, so sometimes you will see withdrawal from certain support systems. So they may begin to withdraw um, even, even from you a little bit, um, but they are maybe being supported somewhere else or what they withdraw from one friend and they're more inclined to be supported by you. Um, sometimes that's just who's understanding, who's listening, who is giving me support right now, who's able, able to give me support right now. Um, but if you really see a withdrawal from all support systems, um, that can be um, a red flag. And red flag behaviors do not mean kids are doomed <laughs> um, or that they're not going to be okay. Um, it's really just kind of a signal of, hey, I need more help. Um, hey, I need a little extra help and that might be a time like this these behaviors are a time that you need to seek out um counseling or reach out to a pediatrician um or play therapy if they're younger um something but these like i said these um behaviors that i have put on the bottom are, are definitely signs and some of the other behaviors too i i don't think when kids are going through something um, like this with their siblings, I don't think there's a bad time to have extra support. Um, but I think if, if these other behaviors are happening, that's definitely a time to get another opinion on, on some support and just see what someone else thinks. Um, but like I said, it doesn't mean that they are not gonna be okay. <laughs> It just means they need a little extra support. Okay, so um, next, just kind of moving um, to how to support them. Um, so a great way is through modeling. And um, so we hear that in parenting all the time is to kind of show kids how you want them to act, right? Um, if you want them to make their bed, then you make your bed. If you, you know, want them to be kind, then you, to, you know, use kind words, then you use kind words. You model for them. It's the same way with expressing their emotions. Um, so as parents, um, parents, they often feel the need to protect their kids from their own emotions. Um, but it's okay to, show an appropriate reaction to a tough situation. And um, because that shows your child that it's okay to react. Um, so what I mean is, you know, you just found out your child needs to go back into the hospital and your, their sibling is standing right there. Instead of saying, well, it's okay, it's just another hospitalization, but inside you're screaming and you're angry you know, just say, oh, I'm so frustrated. I don't want to have to go back into the hospital. Or, you know, if you are really upset about it and it's okay to cry in that moment, 
because it shows your kid because they may be feeling the same ways and it shows them it's okay because now I'm frustrated. I don't want them to go in the hospital either and I can react that way. Obviously, we want to react in, like I said, appropriate ways um, because, again, we want to model the way that um, you would want the child to react to that. So um, you don't want to do anything harmful um, to yourself or others or to property. Um, but an appropriate reaction is, is perfectly great because it shows them it is okay. Um, and kids also just really pick up on when adults hide things. Um, so showing your genuine feelings in whatever way is natural is good because if you are putting on a smile when you feel like crying, they're going to pick up on that. But if you're trying to force tears when you're not feeling that, when you're really feeling frustrated, they're going to pick up on that too. Um, and like we talked about earlier, kids have a really hard time knowing what they feel and connecting that to words. Um, and then also, so connecting that feeling, um, sorry, they have a hard time knowing what they feel, connecting it to words, and then connecting that feeling to making you want to do certain things like acting out or crying, things like that. So identifying your emotions for your kids is great. Um, that was actually objective one um, in my curriculum at grief camp was emotion identification, um, especially for more complex emotions like frustration, jealousy, relief, things like that that are a little bit harder um, for kids and honestly for adults to identify. It's good to say like, I'm just really frustrated because this is not how I wanted this week to go. Or I'm really sad because I did not, I wanted us to spend Thanksgiving as a family together and not have your brother be in the hospital. Um, also, something that came up the last time that um, I got to talk to some of you guys um, was about your kids comforting you. Um, and it's not a bad thing. So while they shouldn't be your caretaker, um, while you are still the parent, showing compassion to another person and being able to recognize another person's emotions is a great quality. Um, so then being able to recognize, mom's sad right now, I should go give her a hug, um, is a wonderful quality to have in any person, um, especially in a child. Um, so if they notice your sadness or your frustration um, and they comfort you, that means that you've taught them well. It means you have done something right um, because they've picked up on that's what you've done for them. Um, you've modeled that for them. And so now they're just repaying that to you. Um, and like I said, it, you know, they don't need to be your caretaker. Um, but, but showing empathy um, is not a bad quality in a person. Um, and that is what they're doing. And it's showing um, that they can do that. So um, another thing that it's sometimes really difficult for parents um, who have a child with special needs and a child who is healthy um, is to kind of integrate their lives together and to involve them together. Um, so in trying to protect healthy siblings, sometimes they can begin to feel isolated in the process um, because we don't want to push responsibility on them. We don't want them to feel as if they have to take care of um, their sibling who is sick. But a lot of times when given the opportunity, they want to be involved in care, but are afraid. Um, so let them help. Teach them things that they can do. Um, it doesn't have to obviously you don't want it to be forced. It doesn't have to necessarily be a chore. But inviting them in and showing them that they're needed helps them integrate into their sibling life and build attachment. Um, what I heard most often from kids that I worked with, siblings who had um, a brother or sister with a you know, severe um, medical need was two things. It's that they didn't know how to interact with their brother or sister 
um, or they didn't think that they could. And um, those were the top, like some of the top things that I heard um, was like, I just don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't, or I don't think I'm allowed. Um, so if you give them things they can do, hook up the G2, rent syringes, um, teach them how to suction. I had a little six year old um, brother one time and anytime it was his job to turn on the suction machine, like anytime they needed it, that was his job and he loved it. He thought it was like the coolest thing ever. Loved turning on the suction machine. Um, and it wasn't a chore. He didn't feel responsible for it. And if he wasn't there, obviously, of course, the mom did it. Um, but when he was, he felt as if he was involved. It wasn't one of those situations where he just, you know, when that happened, when they were in the moment of needing to suction, that he felt pushed out of the room or that he felt like he couldn't be there. Um, it gave him something to do. And it let him still be there with his family in a time where um, otherwise he probably would have kind of felt awkward and probably left the room. Um, and I don't think, you know, if you haven't necessarily been involving your other children in care, I don't think it's a bad thing. Like I said, I think, you know, you're trying to keep them from having too much responsibility, which is great. It's just our, um, as adults, kind of our inclination to want to protect children, but um, it really helps them build attachment. Um, some other ideas are just having them play in the floor while you're doing care. Um, bringing your kiddo who has more needs into the living room with everyone else in the evening. Um, or doing a movie night or homework in their bedroom. Um, just kind of changing that scenery, just being in the vicinity of each other. Um, also, a hot topic right now is being in the hospital um, and not being able to be there together. So while they're in the hospital, you can have the sibling draw a picture, pick out a blanket to send, a hair bow to wear <laughs> um, while they're there. I had um, several siblings that used to do that, and it was like always their job, like, okay, sister has to go to the hospital, you get to pick out which hair bow she's going to take. Um, and that was just something special they got to do. Um, and then if they're not able to visit, like in this time, um, you as the parent could send them back a picture of their brother or sister with the item that they chose. So with the picture hanging in their room in their hospital, with their hair bow on, with their blanket. Um, and that just helps keep them connected even when they're apart and feel like they have a role. Um, so we also just some memory making legacy building things. Um, so let siblings help make memories through tangible items they can keep, um, like some of the things that I have down there. Um, but also, and usually these are more special, um, through moments. Um, things like traditions, Friday movie night, um, things like I said, like they get to pick out something special um, for them to wear, those kind of things, um, make lasting memories. Um, so it doesn't always have to be something like as pictured below um, that they can, that they have. And it can also be something silly. It can be um, anything. I mean, having a special song that they listen to and having it be their song, um, it could be anything, but moments are usually what really stand out more um, than some of these items that maybe um, are more picture perfect, quote unquote, um, and just a great kind of a, to wrap this, wrap it up a little bit, one of my uh, the picture on the far right with all the feathers and pom-poms. It's one of my favorite stories um, from my time uh, working in hospice. Um, it was some, a set of sisters and they, um, one of the sisters is getting pretty near to end of life and I went just to spend some time with them and do collaging. And this, the feathers and pom-poms on the right was what they made. Um, and to, to us, to adults, you look at that and you're just like, okay, you know, that's, that's great. It's beautiful. Um, but it's kind of just a bit of a mess of feathers and pom-poms. Um, but later, this is after um, 
one of the little girls, the, the patient had passed away. Her sisters came to our grief camp and um, they were actually in one of the other groups, but they asked, they were asked what was one of your favorite memories with your sibling. And they wrote about this day when they made this collage and how they had glitter glue all over them. And, um, you know, they threw pom poms at each other and it was just a silly day. And so looking at this, it's not, you know, for me, probably not as cute as some of the other ones I had made. Um, and honestly, not anything I did, but that is something that stands out to them. And we made some other things like these um, with their handprints and um, that, you know, to me looked better, but that is not what stood out to them. It was that day and that moment, um, not the finished product. Um, so, and uh, when Katie saw this on my slide, she said, you guys are very familiar, but um, this quote that, um, that just talks about, you have to take care of yourself before you can take care of others. And I know you guys hear that a lot um, about your children, um, but that, do, that does apply um, to you, all of your children. Um, you know, you have to be in the right space. You have to um, kind of identify your own emotions before you can help the siblings identify theirs. Um, you have to know what you feel before you can help them um, know what they feel. Um, so just keep that in mind is that because you're on this webinar, you're doing a great job. You're, you're trying, you're um, working to uh, look for ways to help your kiddos. Um, so I just thank you for letting me um, talk to y'all and um, I really appreciate it. There's also some um, great resources here and I think Katie's going to send out um, a Word document with these as well, but these are just some extra um, articles and things that you guys can um, look at um, later on about um, supporting siblings. Lindsay, this is Katie. Uh, we will definitely be sharing, um, this is being recorded, the PowerPoint as well as the resources um, that's on your screen right now. We're gonna be making sure that that gets to everybody who's attending. Um, and then also I wanted to go ahead and, um, and ask a little bit about um, where you left off about the memory, you know, keepsake items. Some of our kids, actually all of our kids, um, with paroxysmal disorder have the sensory losses. And I know there may be other people listening that um, don't have children with deaf blindness, but because of the sensory loss, we tend to have, um, I know my own son has been extremely, um, it's been challenging with different textures. And so a lot of times I feel like people um, wanna do these keepsakes with paint and um, the exact pictures that you have on the screen right now. Thank you for backing up to that. Um, but you know, it makes this beautiful keepsake, but the memory, you were talking about the importance of the memory um, and how that stuck out to that little girl more than the, you know, if it was a, a pretty picture, um, like the other ones with the handprints, you would think those would be the, the really pretty ones, but that memory really matters. And it stuck out to me because for me, I don't want, um, I don't want that memory of me forcing my child's hand and him screaming um, when I tried to get that handprint. That's, you know, it's this beautiful keepsake, but it was not a good experience. It was not a positive moment that we had when I was creating that memory. So if you have any suggestions for our families that may face that, um, and then also if anybody else that's listening even um, today in our audience wants to um, be able to share um, through chat or even um, message us and we can share it with other people. We would love to hear about um, your experiences or Lindsay, if you have something additional that you could add to that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so generally what I did with some of my kids who had um, some sensory aversions, would I, I would do things that were much smaller. So not a full hand. I would not use paint um, and kind of just knowing what is it that they don't like. Um, which as a parent, you're going to know that, <laughs> um, you're going to know, is it the cold? Is it, you know, the softness? Is it just being held, um, and having to be, you know, 
pressed up against something, all those things. So no one they don't like. Um, but thumb prints were a little bit um, easier because you could do it super fast. It wasn't a full, a lot of time, um, there's also just not as much feeling um, in your thumb as there is your whole palm. And um, so that's one option if they um, don't mind just like a little bit of being touched on their hand. Um, is to do like a small thumbprint with ink instead of paint. Ink also, once it's on, you can't tell that it's on there. Um, so you can usually do it. And the one in the middle is actually ink. Um, and she did not like paint <laughs> on her hands. Um, so that is why that one is an ink print. Um, and so that was one thing I did a lot. Um, would I would just do really small thumbprints with ink um, because you could get it on really quickly and then you can't feel that it's on there. Um, whereas paint, once it's on, like you feel that it's there, honestly, like after you wash it off, you still feel that it's there. Um, but also doing things like, you know, saving locks of hair, saving their clothes. Um, there's a great resource, um, an organization called Songs of Love. If you guys, some of you may, may already be familiar with them, but um, they create a personalized song about your child. Um, we utilized them a lot um, for, and it's free. It's a nonprofit organization, so you get it for free. Um, trying to think of some other ideas. Yeah, those, are some, those are great ideas actually <laughs> i appreciate you sharing um and i know that even yeah the fingerprint can be a big difference between putting the, the entire hand in there so something as simple as that can even be helpful um so in regards to the modeling the behavior i really just want to emphasize like i felt that was such an important thing um that was brought up in previous events that you've joined us on um you know making sure that modeling behavior doesn't mean that you can't be sad um, it doesn't mean that you have to smile, um, but it makes me think about the siblings as well. And we know how resilient siblings can be. Um, and so I, I've met them. I know they are. But there's also cases that are just not talked about. Um, and these children are struggling. Um, and that's okay. Um, and that's not unusual. And I was wondering if you could speak to that. I don't think that's something that we talked about this evening. Um, that could be a topic that I think is, is kind of kept a little bit quiet because we, we do put a lot of pressure sometimes on saying, you know, how resilient our kids are. And it's not that they're not, but they're human. Yeah. And I think, um, so with kids, I think the saying that they're resilient does not always mean that everything is going to be perfect. Um, and that's what I reminded parents a lot of is, you know, your kids, if they go through something difficult, they're probably going to struggle with it for a really long time. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're not going to be productive members of society. It doesn't mean that they're not going to be happy adults, but they're still going to carry this grief with them. They're still going to have this um, with them, and that is normal. Um, it's, it's, it's good. You don't want them to forget. They're not going to forget, even if you did want them to forget, um, they're not going to. Um, so it does happen a lot. I mean, kids, some kids are going to need more support than others. Um, but, and needing more support doesn't mean that you haven't done your job. It just means they need more support. Um, and it's really hard to predict, um, honestly, which kids are gonna um, require what kind of supports. Um, there were some kids that I worked with for a long time that coped beautifully, did great all through the illness. Um, and I was like, you know, they they like had all the knowledge they had wonderful coping skills established and a while later they started having some not so healthy coping skills and they needed a little extra support and it was not something i would have guessed and then there were other siblings who i really really worried about um and later coped wonderfully and so i think it just it happens um we don't know what each person's individual grief is going to look like. 
Um, we don't know what our own grief is going to look like. Um, and, and it's, it's okay to need some extra help, I guess is the bottom line. <laughs> Thank you. And Tosh, I just wanted to share, she, um, in the chat, um, wanted to share with everyone uh, that her daughter got a lot out of making an album of photos of her and her brother with support at, from a teacher at school. Um, so that's another way a sibling can make memory art. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, I do have a question for you. Um, can you help parents tell their other children about the illness? Um, the child life specialist, I'm assuming that's what they meant. Um, would you be the person that would actually do that? Would you coach the parents? What would that look like? Yes, so, um, well, I cannot speak for every child life specialist um, out there, but for the most part, my philosophy and most of the other child life specialists I know prefer to train the parents in how to tell siblings. Um, I believe things are best coming from a person that they trust the most. Um, so most of the time that person's gonna be their parent. Um, I may be someone coming in that they've known for a couple weeks. I may, I may be brand new that day. Um, so while some child life specialists will help to facilitate the conversation, um, I have done that in the past where I was present um, while parents had a conversation, but beforehand, like I would meet with a parent beforehand and go through, here's some ideas. Here's what I think this kind of, should look like, could look like with your kids, and I'll be here to support you, but I would really like for you to kind of tell them, be the, be that person, um, because sometimes, too, if it's coming from an outside um, source, it can feel as though the parents were hiding something, um, so I have a firm belief that it's always best coming from the person that's trusted most, but supports child life is there, um, to help you through that and to help facilitate that if needed. Um, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> we also, we have another great question um, that's come through. My daughter really wants to go back to school this fall, but I don't think it's likely given my son's medical fragility. How do you, how do you help a child work through missing out on life experiences due to their siblings illness? That is a great question. Um, so I think you're just honest. Um, and having and saying, you know, we love your brother, right, brother, yes. <laughs> uh, we love your brother so much and we want to keep him healthy. And because of the coronavirus right now, um, we're going to all have to stay home a little bit more, which includes not being able to go to school um, so that we can all stay healthy. And I think kind of framing it as, you know, keeping us all healthy um, instead of just him, but saying, you know, we all need to stay healthy. We're all going to have to um, stay home more. Um, but your brother gets sick a little bit easier than the rest of us do. And so we have to be more careful. Um, but then, you know, just letting her voice her frustrations because there's probably going to be, some, well, that's not fair, and, and saying, I know, it's really not fair, and just validating that, validating their feelings, because um, I feel like it's, it's easy for us to be like, well, you can't say that it's not fair, he can't help it, which is true, um, neither of them can help it um, at this point, and I feel like it's, it's good to remember that, is that neither of them have control over it, um, and so just say, just validating how she's feeling. Um, so, you know, it, the feelings of it's not fair, but it, you know, those kind of things and say, no, it's not. And hopefully we'll be able to go to school again soon. Um, and hopefully it will be more safe later on and, you know, finding a compromise and saying, we can FaceTime with your friends. We can, um, do other things that, um, are maybe, special um to kind of balance out the things that she's not getting to do and i know Lindsay and i thank you for that that great answer we we talked even about um you know 
COVID-19 and the impact right now that it may be having on child life specialty services. Um, and we have, you can't have this conversation right now without kind of addressing and bringing it up and just recognizing that our families are already isolated and need these supports. And right now we're even more isolated. Everybody is. So ours just increased and we're spread thin on supports. And when you were talking during your presentation about recognizing sleeping and eating um, habits and, and are anything, is anything changing? And so be on the lookout for things like that. And how, that's got to be heightened right now because everybody's routines have changed and nothing is quote unquote normal right now. Um, so that just kind of goes into a little bit of that question and that topic of this is this is a really difficult time more than it already was. We have another question um, about do you have any suggestions for parents when a sibling of a child with complex medical needs also has disabilities. Um, the children have two totally different needs. Yeah. Um... So I guess what specifically, just like balancing that or um, being able to explain it to both of them? I'm sorry, I don't know if I understand. Yeah, the question came through, do you, do you have any qu suggestions for parents when the sibling of children with complex medical needs also has disabilities? And maybe just some of the suggestions that we've had about sharing um, and talking with them um, because of their disability, they're not able to do that. Yeah, so I think just keeping in mind what their developmental level is. Um, so if they're, you know, whatever, it's not always age. Um, obviously, keeping in mind, like, what can they understand? What can, what can we um, communicate? And then also keeping in mind, there might be some increased frustrations um, because they're going through things themselves um, in addition to going through things with their sibling. Um, so I think being able to, um, I think a lot of the suggestions are the same, still having them be involved together when possible, um, finding ways for them to build a bond and an attachment um, with each other, um, and of course with you as well, um, which can, be more difficult when they have different needs. Um, but I think just keeping in mind the developmental level, um, and one of these resources has a great kind of breakdown based on age, um, but you can kind of adjust that and read um, based on um, what they would need, um, kind of based on their understanding and that kind of thing. Another um, question is about resources. Um, are there any good books to use for children in story time at home to assist the understanding of the medically complex kid, progression, death, and grief? Um, yeah, so for like death and grief, I have tons obviously because that's what I did for a long time, but The Invisible String is my very favorite. Um, it's great for it's, it's very broad, it's not specific to anything, so I like to use it, um, but it's good for hospitalization and then also into grief, because it just kind of talks about being separated um, and how we're all connected by love. And um, even when you're not together, you still love. Um, and so it, it does talk about heaven. So if that's something that you believe in, that would be a good, um, one to use for that. Um, I can send a list. I'm having a hard time like pulling them no, out of my head. No, I can send a list. <laughs> so sorry about that. And you thank you for just at least giving one. And I know that puts you on the spot. I was going to suggest I, I made myself a note. And I think that that was a great question. And we can definitely um, yeah, we can follow up afterwards. And we can add that to this resource um, listing that's going to go out to everybody. Yeah. Um, so we don't put you on the spot. Um, Another question that I know has come up um, more than once, um, and we even talked about it in our past event, was what do I do um, if they ask if their sibling's going to die? Be honest. Um, that is always my suggestion. Um, it always has been. I tell parents, I'm like, you can take it or leave it, but I think being honest. Um, and 
it doesn't have to, you know, come out and obviously you can, you can say, we don't know when, um, but yes, their condition, um, there, there's not, there's not a cure for their condition there. Um, they are not going to get better and eventually their body's going to stop working. Um, and that's usually kind of the way that we explain death to younger children, um, is that their body doesn't work anymore um, that it is too sick and it doesn't work. Um, but yeah, I always suggest being honest because if they are already, if they're asking the question, um, that means they already think it's a possibility. Um, yeah. There are a lot of kind of theories, I guess, on on at what point you tell a child based on their age. Because um, when they're younger, the farther in advance you tell them, sometimes it can be... Um, cause more worry but if they are already asking the question that means that they've already thought about it um so if they bring it up i always say to to answer honestly because if you say no and then later have to come back and say um no that there is no you know they are not going to get better they are going to die um then it can feel as if the first time wasn't the truth. Thank you. And then I wanted to switch gears just, I know you're, um, it sounds like we might be having some connection issues. Um, hopefully, um, I just oh. wanted to, I had one more. Um, it, it might be on my end, I'm not sure, but I just wanted to um, get another question in there that I think is really important. And that's, uh, it's something that happens um, with our families and the GFPD quite a bit. Um, and that is my child who died was my only child at the time. Um, can your specialty help me to know how to talk with our future children about their sister they never met? Yes, absolutely. Um, I did that a good bit in, um, in hospice was to help parents create um, kind of memory books or memory boxes for their future siblings. Um, and I think that that is a great thing to do as you have, um, if you have additional children after you have lost a child, is to continue talk to, talking about them. Let them know about their brother or sister. Um, let them know about who they were and what, um, what they were like and what similarities they had. Um, kids love to know like what they are like someone else. Um, and seeing pictures and so, and also having something that is their own of them. Um, because sometimes kids who um, are younger, even, even if they were alive at the same time, but maybe don't remember um, when their older sibling, um, they don't remember before they died, um, they can kind of feel disconnected from the rest of the family because everyone else is grieving this person and they don't remember them or they didn't know them. Um, so having things that is just theirs. Um, so I always suggest to families to either, you know, have, like make a scrapbook or a memory box or something um, that you can give to the siblings that will be theirs. Um, sometimes they would even like buy gifts, um, like dolls or a stuffed animal or something that would kind of be from um, the, the sibling who had passed away to the younger siblings. Um, and it's just kind of a connection um, to help them, one, get to know their, their sibling um, and also have that connection um, to the rest of the family because that is something that um, everyone else experienced that they did not experience. Thank you for sharing. I know that's a, a topic that definitely um, impacts our families. So we appreciate you sharing. Um, 
another thing I know you told everybody that I shooed your profession away <laughs> many times when we spoke a year ago, um, but it's true. And I, and I, that's why I think it's so important that you come and you share about this specialty because I didn't know about it. And I wondered how many other parents don't know and not just parents, but professionals. Um, and so before I, I we close out tonight, I, I wanted to, to, you know, share quickly that, um, you know, as a parent to a child with deaf blindness, um, many people don't know how to approach our child. So we're, we're protective as well um, because of that. And I think that when someone's coming at me with a toy, it's not only are you going to make the situation worse <laughs> and you're not going to be able to help me and I need you just to go away. It's, are you going to come up and just approach my child in a way that's going to be um, more stressful and you're, and you're going to grab their hand and not know that that's not something that you would do. And so I know when we met a year ago and we had this conversation, you started to work um, with our state deaf blind project um, in having conversations. And I just wanted to share today before we closed out that that's something that I recommend um, any professionals or parents listening to definitely do. Reach out to your hospital, know about this and in, this incredible service that's here and support that can be there for your family. And also the ability to bring people together and collaborate so that it's, it's a win-win for everyone. It's gonna be a win-win for the patient, for the siblings, for all the family members, um, and also for the child life specialist, the professionals that are serving this family. If we, if we all come together and can, can know how to do this, we're gonna be able to provide the best support for our children. And so I just wanted to share that because I didn't know what you did, but I also was very protective and you don't know about his unique disability. So um, I really encourage any professionals um, that may be listening today um, or even to this recording to reach out to your to your hospital systems and find out who your child life specialists are and and help them to know this so that they can better approach um, and then I also think it's really important to emphasize um, that what you shared so many of us moms um, and dads are we have it together we know our resources they're attending these webinars and they're getting all this information and I think it can be very misleading and it's really hard for someone like me to ask for help. Um, and so if we're not asking for help and we're giving this illusion that we've got it, we're, we're, we've got this all covered, we're not going to receive this referral. So I really appreciate you coming on and sharing about um, this specialty and the services and supports that you can provide to our families. Um, to our families, thank you for taking the time and participating. Uh, this 